Here we are, coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike. You know who I am. And I am live with you today. Glad to be with you. Um, I'm going to deal with a question um, right at the beginning today. Somebody sent me this. Lori sent this in to me. And um, I always like to I always like to help out, especially on things like this. Um I'm going to read her email, and um, we're going to, i got some articles to read, and we're just going to have fun. If you've got any questions that you'd like to send in during today's broadcast, I'd love to take a look at them. The email address there at the bottom of your screen right there, pastormikeonline at gmail.com. Uh, send it in during the broadcast today. I'll be watching for that. Uh, and something to always keep in mind when... You send emails to our ministry. If you send them to this email address, Pastor Mike Online, they may not get seen. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday, I, I look through them and, and, and look for things people are sending me, people are asking me, things like that. But I've seen change of address requests. I've seen orders on this email address, and they may get missed. And so the if you have an order or a change of address or anything like that, send that to kingjamescode at gmail.com is one of them, or Pastor Mike at kingjamescode.org is another one, and um, or just go to any of our websites and send us an email from there, and we'd love to take a look at it and love to help you out. Lori sends this in, and uh, she is asking about the death of King Saul. Now, what I'm going to have everybody do is get a King James Bible out, not an NIV, not an RSV, not a New American Standard, not anything like that. We're going to look at the, what the King James says. And uh, and she's asking this because, and we're going to look at 1 Samuel 31, 2 Samuel 1, 2 Samuel 21. And she says, I'm confused. I tried to walk circumspectly, like, uh, you know, like you say, for all the verses, and I'm still confused. And she said, and I'll kind of get into it here a little bit. Can you explain this for me? I was trying to teach a younger woman about there not being any contradictions in the King James. And I was given these scriptures by another friend who believes he knows the Bible better than me. Um, and so anyway, what I want you to do is, before we turn to these passages, I'm, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you how people are. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, we're told a lot of things about our Bible. We are told that in verse 25 of 1 Peter 1, the word of the Lord endureth forever. Um, you go read Isaiah 40. You, all flesh is grass, but the word of our God standeth forever. All flesh is grass, and the grass fadeth and the flower fadeth. The original manuscripts of the Bible are lost. They are gone. They have faded away. Many of the copies of the Old Testament and the New Testament were written on grass. They were written on papyrus, which is, uh, which is grass. They were written on vellum, which is animal skin, which is flesh. Flesh and grass fade away, and the things that they wrote the Bible on and copied the Bible on have faded away. But God promised, in spite of that, that his word would endure forever. And so I am, I am being told by my Bible to believe that God's word would last, it would endure, it would be around forever, it was perfect when it was written, it would be perfect in today's world. The words of the Lord are pure words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And here's what people do. They ignore what the Bible tells them to believe. They ignore it. That makes them ignorant. That's what it makes them. They ignore what the Bible tells them. They ignore the doctrines that are given to them. And they put in its place the doctrines of men. Men, I would say, of in some cases, men of corrupt minds. How can I say something like that? How can I say that just because somebody doesn't have my stance on the Bible, that they are corrupt men? Let me read to you what Peter taught us in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, number, verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, you know what that means? That means you've got a, um, you've got a secret agenda. 
you will beguile people. You'll lie to people. We're supposed to lay that aside in all hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. And he said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would be a stone that the builders rejected. And you look around you. We're living in a time right now where people, men or women, are trying to build churches. They're trying to build congregations. They're trying to build mega centers. They're trying to build a name for themselves. And they're using everything in the world except the chief cornerstone, elect and precious. They're using everything else. They will not use the stone of the corner. They won't use the word of God, the infallible, inerrant word of God. They would rather have it in their mind that the Bible isn't what it appears to be, that the Bible has mistakes in it. I then will change the errors. I will correct all the mistakes so that you are not misled by your Bible for crying out loud. I will direct you and I will guide you. And it's like they're building something in their name and in their honor. I don't have a problem in the world giving all the honor and all the praise and all the worship over to the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. I don't want it. I don't want the adoration. I don't want I don't want all that. I don't have a problem saying, "Hey, it's in your Bible. Why don't you just read it?" But there are people out there who don't who have rejected the chief cornerstone of their building. They, they're building and building and building, but the very, the very foundation of what it is they're supposed to be building on, they have rejected that. It's the stone that the builders rejected. And so he says in verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And the word here, confounded, means confused. You just believe the Bible. And you trust the Bible. And if you don't understand everything the Bible says, you still trust it. And if some of it doesn't seem at the time to make sense, you still rely on it. It's, I'm telling you, there will probably come a time in your life, like what happened with me, when the Bible is all you do trust. You don't trust people. You definitely don't trust yourself. The only thing that you have to rely on and to fall back on is the word of God. And so in verse 7, he said, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and by the way, let me clear something up here. The, the head of the corner is not a capstone on top of a pyramid. It's not. The head of the corner is a corner stone. The Bible talks in another place. Paul, I think Paul mentioned this, that the church is built upon the foundation of the, pro, the, prophet, the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. The, that foundation includes the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. We are not living in or building a pyramid with a capstone on top of it. That doctrine crept in. I kind of did some research on this here a while back. In the late 1800s, there was this fascination with the pyramids of Egypt. And there were several writers who were writing books back at that time that were trying to take the dimensions and the layout and the whatever of the, of the Great Pyramid in Egypt and say that the Jews built it as the, uh, as the temple of God and this is, what, this is what heaven looks like. Heaven is a pyramid. And I'm just going, that sounds like a 
pyramid scheme is what it sounds like. And I don't buy it. I don't believe it for a second. And they said, well, you know, the only way that you can believe uh, in heaven is to believe that it's a pyramid because uh, John said in Revelation that it's a city built four square. And I'm going, well, there's your clue there, Sherlock. It's a square. It's not a triangle. It is four squares, not four triangles. People just believe what they want to believe. But anyway, and you, there, and you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also they were appointed. Now, here's what I'm going to show you. In verses uh, verse um, 7 and 8, you're told that your Bible is precious, and I believe that. But there are people out there, to them, the Bible is it's almost nothing. And it's almost like an annoyance that they have to keep preaching out of that old Bible every Sunday. I mean, wait, can we come up with better material than that? And some of them try to. And so the thing is, there are going to be places in your Bible that are going to be stumbling block issues or stumbling block places in your Bible. And those who already want to believe that the Bibles all have mistakes in them, they will look at places like that and they'll say, see, right here, it's all contradictory. And it see, there's mistakes in the Bible. They didn't write it out right. They didn't copy it right. They didn't get the story straight. That's why we don't believe that any Bible has been preserved or any Bible is inspired. That's why they say that. And what the Bible's telling you, what Peter's telling you is, is that the reason why they had these stumbling blocks in their Bible is that they're disobedient. They're dis they would be disobedient to the Bible even though it is the inerrant word of God. They're just disobedient. So there are stumbling block places in the Bible. And Lori, I'm not accusing you of this at all. No way, no how. But you're going to have people who are, who are going to try to trip you up and, and get you to fight in their backyard. What I mean by that is they know how they can try to get an advantage over you by asking you questions that you may not have the answer to immediately. And there are times when people, when there are people who try to do that to me, they'll try to trip me up and they'll say, oh yeah, well, what about this? And they'll say some verse and I'll say, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't immediately have an answer for that particular question. But what I'm telling you is, I believe that my Bible is right because my Bible tells me that my Bible is right. These And just give them verses of what it is you believe. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. Give them Bible verses because they can't handle that. They cannot handle Bible verses. That's when they'll start calling you names and throw stuff at you, all right? But anyway, here he is. Here, here's the dilemma that she's in, and people will try to use things like this to trip you up, to make you think. See, they, when they copied these copies, they didn't copy them right. They made mistakes in them. And so only the original manuscripts are inspired. All of the copies have mistakes in them. That's what they're going to try to tell you, and they're lying through their teeth. They want to believe that because they don't want to believe the Bible. Paul said, or Peter said they were disobedient. Here's the issue. There are three places in the King James where it discusses the death of Saul. And it appears to, to some people that these three are contradictory to one another. So let's look at it very quickly. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 31. Here's the original story of how Saul died. 1 Samuel chapter 31. We're going to read, we're going to start at verse 1. And we're going, to, we're going to work through this here. In verse 1 of 1 Samuel 31, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons, and the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, Saul's sons. 
And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Now, here's, here's the first thing you need to do. Where's my pen? Where's my pen? Here's my pen. Make a note here, underline that passage where it says, the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. The archers were the Philistines. So we can see right here, you just write a little note here, the, the Philistines injured Saul. Had it not been for the archers of the Philistines shooting arrows, striking Saul, had it not been for that, uh, and it and it apparently it brought it hit him so hard that it brought him down and he was not able to 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 run he was not able to fight further he wasn't able to do anything he was he was wounded and more than likely he was mortally wounded but he hadn't died yet so Saul knowing that he's just been hit with an arrow. And if Saul would have been, you know, like Clint Eastwood or John Wayne, that would have been nothing. He'd have fought the battle, okay? But he was Saul. So in verse 4, Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. And Saul was telling his armor bearer, Take my sword and kill me. Finish it off, because I do not want the Philistines to come. If the Philistines come to me, they'll leave me alive just long enough to, to make me wish I had died. And Saul was very, remember, God left Saul. God had left him. God's spirit had left him. And so Saul was very afraid, and he's asking his armor bearer to draw his own sword, Saul's sword, and thrust him through and kill him immediately. But his armor bearer would not, for he was so afraid. He, his armor bearer wouldn't touch him. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, underline that, Saul was dead. He fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So now we have, in verse 6, so Saul died, and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. Um, and let's keep on reading here because this is germane to how we're going to bring this about, how we're going to answer this question. Because it looks like that there are three different renderings or tellings in the Bible of how Saul died, and they seem to be contradictory to one another. But when we read them as a whole and understand it, then we see that it's, that it's not a contradiction. Verse 7, when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side, Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And here's, here's what the Philistines did. Verse 9, they cut off his head stripped off his armor, and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. That's a goddess. That's, uh, that's the Virgin Mary, by the way, and Catholics. And they fastened his body uh, to the wall of Beth Shan. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and burned them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. And it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites and David abode two days in Ziklag. Now, here's what we're going to do now. Let's. Oh, that was the beginning of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1. All right? Now, it, so now we understand from... 1 Samuel 31, that Saul was mortally wounded, realizing the Philistines were going to run up, run up on him, and he wanted to be dead by the time they got there. So he asked his armor bearer, put your sword in me, and his armor bearer wouldn't do it. So then he takes a sword, and he falls on his own sword and ends his life. And his armor bearer did the exact same thing. When the Philistines came... They found Saul dead, they cut his head off, they stripped his body, 
and they hung his, th these people are grotesque. It sounds like Muslims. They took his dead body and hung it up on a wall. Probably had his head, you know, hanging up there too. So the Philistines, they're the ones that fired the shot, the arrow shot that went into him that caused Saul to realize I'm going to be dead, but I'm not dead now and probably won't be for a little while, and I don't want the Philistines to find me alive. So then he took his own life. Now we have, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, let's look at, um, let's start in verse 1. It came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto the, him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered. Now, this, this young man is an Amalekite. He's not an Israelite. He's an Amalekite. And, um, or at least I think if I'm reading that right, hold a man came out of the camp of Saul and clothes ran. All right. Anyway, David said, said unto him, may not be, but anyway, he said unto him, how went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered that the people are fled from the battle and many of the people also are fallen and dead and Saul and Jonathan, his son are dead also. David said unto the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, um, his son be dead? Here is what the young man said. Here is his version of it, his story. And we're going to find out that he doesn't tell the same story that we just read. Why did he not tell the same story? Look at it. The young man that told him said, as I happened by chance upon Mount Geboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I and answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am Malachi. That's where I got that from. I knew I was right. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I, here we go. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord, this young man, um, he says uh, in verse 13, he said, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. David said unto him, verse 14, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And so here's the thing. This, we already found out clearly that when Saul leaned upon his own sword, he died. And then his armor bearer. And by the time the Philistines came up to him, he was dead. Here's a young man who happened upon Saul, dead, took his, took his crown, took his bracelet, went running up to, uh, went running up to David, knowing that Saul hated David and was thinking that David hated Saul and that David would be glad and proud that someone finally had the nerve to kill evil Saul. So he comes up to David with this story that Saul fell upon a spear. That's not what the previous chapter said. He got, the, he got how he died wrong. And he goes up to him, and Saul is going, I'm dying, and I, but I, I, it's, not, it's not helping. I need help. And so the young man slew him, and he took his crown and his bracelet, running up to David to be honored by the new king of Israel, David. And David said, oh, so you killed him? Oh, okay. Uh, can we get this guy's head cut off? This man put his hand on the Lord's anointed, and he's not going to live because of it. This Amalekite, I think, according to his, I mean, it's obviously obvious to me that he lied. He lied through his teeth to David, thinking that he was going to get some kind of honor out of it. And David said, oh, okay, so you, let me get this straight. You killed Saul, and you cut his, you, you're, you're the one that brought me the crown and the, and the bracelet 
okay, well, you've just killed the Lord's anointed, and therefore I'm going to have you dead. And they killed him right then and there. And they said his blood's going to be on his hands. And that's what I see here in this chapter is that this Amalekite whom, um, let's see here. Anyway, I'm, I'm trying to put all the pieces together. But this Amalekite thought that he was really going to get some, some honor and praise here. And he went running to David with a story that does not match the first story that we read in the Scripture about how Saul died. The Bible plainly says that when Saul fell upon his sword, that he died. End of story. This guy lied about it, thinking he was going to get some kind of benefit um, out, of, out of David. And then we have 2 Samuel 21. Is that where? Yeah, 2 Samuel 21, verse 12. The Bible says, And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them, when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. Now, here's what I see in this. It is accurate to say that the Philistines were responsible for the death of Saul because the Philistine archer fired the shot, the arrow going into Saul gave him what would probably be a mortal wound. And Saul, realizing that he was wounded and he was not going to recover from it, and there was no ambulance waiting to take him away, no military helicopters to, to evac him to a mobile army surgical hospital, realizing that he was going to die, but by the time the Philistines got there, he may still be alive. So he chooses to fall upon his own sword. Were the, were the Philistines responsible, ultimately responsible for his death? And the answer, I think, is yes. And so, Lori, I hope that, I hope that helps you. I hope that the idea, and again, I'm not, I'm not accusing you of, of doubting or saying the Bible's got errors in it. But what I'm going to tell you people is, is that there are people out there who hate your King James Bible, and they hate you because of it. And they think, they think that they can outsmart you with their stumbling block. Verse. They think they can get you to trip over the same thing that they tripped over. That's what they think. Because if, after all, you fall too, well, then that doesn't make them, you any better than them because they fell over it too. They fell for it. They think there's mistakes in their Bibles. They think there are contradictions. They think that because one story says this and another story says this, that obviously some scribe didn't copy the copy down right. And so, therefore, there, we know for a fact there are mistakes in all the Bibles. And that is, you, you, here's, here's, what, here's what Joe says. Joe says, you don't believe that King James only stuff, do you? You don't believe the Bible's inspired, do you? Why, we all know that it's not. I can prove it. There are contradictions here. Joe says there's mistakes in your Bible. Your Bible says there are no mistakes in the Bible. And you have to ask yourself, who do I believe? Who do I trust? Who is it that loves me day and night? Who is it that causes me when I'm praying to weep? Who is it that I'm asking to save my eternal soul from the damnation of hell? Who is that? It's not Joe. It's God. And at some point, God's people wake up one day and they say, you know what? My Bible's precious to me. God's made it that way. And if somebody wants to try to wrap my head around some riddle that they can't figure out in the Bible, then that's fine, but I'm going to believe what my Bible says. And if I don't have an answer for them, then I don't have an answer for them. And let me give you this, too. I think there's some, he, he clearly says here in 1 Peter, in, in chapter 2, verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of fence, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Let me tell you this. There may be, on some of these alleged contradictions of the Bible, you may actually know the answer to them. You may have studied it out and said, you know what, I, 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 yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I think I believe that. And all of a sudden, some person, Facebook, 
whatever chat group, maybe somebody you go to church with, all of a sudden they hit you with one of these alleged contradictions in the Old Testament. And you had the answer to it, but all of a sudden when they hit you with it, you, you were going, uh, 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 you know, I... Um, you know, I used to have that answer. Um, let me, I can't, I, I, I don't remember. I can't remember the answer. You ever had that happen? You know what I think? I think God doesn't want you to answer them. Why? Because he's already appointed them to stumble at the Bible, at the word, being disobedient. He's already appointed them to it. He's not going to let you answer them. He's not. I just just something to, something to think about, something to pray about, all right? But, Laura, I appreciate you sending that in, and I hope that is a, um, hope that is a blessing to you. You know what? I'm going to roll here. Bruce writes in, says, Hi, Pastor, you think that Jeremiah 31, 22 is for our time? Well, Bruce, I'll tell you what. I'll go turn my Bible to Jeremiah 31. How's that? Jeremiah 31. I'm flipping the pages of my King James Bible here. I'm going to lick my fingers. And um, I was always the guy in school that sat in the front row of the classroom so that when the teacher come by with a stack of papers to be handed out to all the students, she always came to my row and licked her fingers and then divvied out the papers. So the paper that I got had teachers spit all over the top of it. That was me. Jeremiah 31, verse 22. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. So your question is, do you think Jeremiah 31, 22 is for our time and the gay agenda? I thought of... I'm having a hard time saying it. I thought of, let me say it how I want to say it. The athlete formerly known as Bruce. All right. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Now, here's what, here's what I think. And, it, and I think that you're seeing it the right way. For years in this country, the religion of Jesus Christ could be said, this is the religion of America. This is the religion of Americans. In spite of all the other conspiracy theories that are out there about the founding fathers this and the founding fathers that, the forefathers of, the, of this nation, the true forefathers, most of them, not all of them, most of them were um, religious separatists, Puritans and other groups who did not want to bow to the king of England. They didn't want to bow to the archbishop of Canterbury. They didn't want to bow to the pope of Rome. They wanted to come to a place where they could worship God freely, and that's what they did. And for years, the religion of America was the religion of Jesus Christ, the man. That's all being done away with in this nation. And now a woman is compassing a man, surrounding, overpowering. What woman is that? Well, it might be pictorialized or the fruition of what this woman is be seen in the athlete formerly known as Bruce. That woman, I think, is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. I think that's who that woman, I think this is the, the strange woman mentioned in Proverbs, uh, all through the book of Proverbs. If you're watching our Wednesday night Bible study last night, you'll know that I gave everybody a homework assignment. I want you to read the book of Proverbs specifically. Oh, let's say chapters 1 through chapter 9, chapter 10, somewhere around in there. I want you to understand these two women that are in the book of Proverbs. The wise woman, wisdom, mentioned in Proverbs 8. You'll see the strange woman mentioned in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. Uh, chapter 7 gives a detailed account of how she lures people in and so on. 
And so, uh, uh, Bruce, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that you are the athlete formerly known as Bruce, all right? Um, but anyway, I, I think that the whole sodomite agenda is being propped up by Mystery Babylon the Great, whereas God ordains and blesses, uh, we would call it straight marriage, between a man and a woman, a male and a female, she now is promoting and pushing her agenda, which is let's break the bands asunder. Let's destroy what marriage is according to the Word of God, and let's have men marrying men. Let's have women marrying women. Let's have women. Let's have multiple women marrying multiple men, and versa visa. Okay, that's what that's what I think is going on. So, Bruce, I think it's a good question, and I think it's valid here. Uh, Darlene, Pastor Mike, question. Is there scripture for someone who needs spiritual, emotional, and mental healing from a soul tie? S-O-U-L-T-I-E. I am no longer in it, but sometimes the mind and heart wander. Thank you. Darlene, that's a new one. I have never heard of a soul tie. Never heard of that one. So I don't know that I can. I don't know that I can help you with it because I don't know exactly um, what that is. All right. Um, Barbara writes and says, Pastor Mike, is there a sound Bible college that you would recommend? Um. Barbara, if there was, I don't know about it. I don't, I, I don't have any affiliations with um, any Bible college. Um, I don't have, uh, I didn't send my kids to one. We don't have one at this church. We don't have one where we send our young people to. Um, there's some who say, well, you go to this college or you go to that college. They're King James only. But I'm going to tell you, you got to be careful. When you go to a Bible college, and I, and I would just say this to anybody, maybe there are some decent Bible colleges out there. When you go to Bible college, I don't care what you do in life or what you're used to, when you, when you go to that Bible college, you're going to come out of that different than what you were. Is that going to be better or worse than what you were? I don't know. I just know that you're going to be different. I was. And my mom knew it. My mom saw it. And there was differences in me that she did not like. She sent her boy out there, and he, come, he comes back, and he's not the same boy that she raised. And so I just don't really get into recommending Bible colleges. That's just not something that I am comfortable with doing. Um. I imagine that there are some Bible colleges that probably use the King James that would probably teach things that I would go, you know what, um, no, I'm sorry, that don't, that's not right. I don't, I don't agree with that. And so I, I just really don't really get into that, Barbara, okay? So if the Lord wants, I don't know if you're asking about yourself or your son or whatever, but um, you, the Lord is the only one who's going to have to answer that question for you, okay? Um, let's see here. Derek. Derek says, why are we surprised that stuff like this is happening? Stuff like what, Derek? Uh, I think sometimes uh, Christians act as if this is shocking information in regards to the Bible and its absolute truth is being attacked. Chapters like 2 Timothy 3 are proof that things like this should be expected. Paul said, but understand this, that in the last days there will come... What? What? Derek, you're quoting 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I have no idea where you got this quotation from. I have, in fact, I, I'm going to go, everybody, take your King James Version Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and... Um, Let's read it from the King James, shall we? 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The email says, Paul said, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. What in the world is that? What, is it, what are times of difficulty? That's not what it says. Difficulty, something that's difficult and something that is perilous, two different things. They're not the same thing. I may have a difficult time getting up out of bed every morning, but it's not life-threatening either way. But it may be difficult. I may, be, I may have difficulty getting my car started sometimes, but it's not life-threatening. It's not perilous if I do or don't. That's the difference right there. Uh, Derek, I love you. I have no idea where you got this verse from, but it's not the Word of God. They say two different things. Let me read, continue reading his email. Let's stop being surprised. From the moment Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts 1, the last days began. The challenge is for Christians to read their Bibles and know what their Bibles actually say. I would agree with that one. I sure would. I, I, Derek, I think you ought to know that you've got the wrong Bible verse there on your email. It's not, it's not the right, it's not the Word of God. This is not difficult times. This is perilous times. It's a big whopping difference. Okay? Derek goes on to say, I'm not surprised that this world lives by worldly standards. I think the biggest problem in our culture is so-called believers do not know the Bible. <laughs> I agree with that. I think you're dead on there, uh, Derek. Derek, let me, let me get you to do something. Uh, get on your computer. And go to uh, purebiblesearch.com and download and install the King James Pure Bible Search software. It'll have the right verses in it. You can just copy and paste them, okay? Derek, I strongly encourage you to follow your own words. Get to know this Bible. And if you do, you'll see that there is a clear difference between the King James and whatever Bible this is, you wrote in. Big difference, all right? Let's stop worrying about what the world is doing, and let's start living in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Um, now, Derek, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. That last part there, let's stop worrying about the world is doing? I, no, uh-uh. That's our job. It's our job to pay attention, to walk circumspectly. It's our job to look into what's going on around us. It's our job to be able to identify where the danger is coming from. That's what God's people do. They're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And the things that are going on in this world, they are concerning to us because we have children and grandchildren that we had planned on raising in a halfway decent society. And now all of that's been taken away from us, and it is a major concern for us. Derek, I don't mean you any harm, bud, but I think you ought to, whatever Bible that is you got, I think you ought to, if you've got a, if you've got a table in your house that's like wobbly, take that Bible you got that verse from and open it up until it fits right underneath that bad leg of that table so the table doesn't wallow anymore, all right? That would be my advice to you. Um, I'm on a roll here looking at emails. By the way, I'm waiting. For, if you've got questions or anything like that, send them in. I'd love to read them. And while we are, while I'm waiting for some new emails, uh, I've mentioned before about our Living Waters for Kenya project. Uh, we are trying to raise the funds to dig some wells out in Samburu County, where our radio station, Watchman FM, is located. And if you would like to help us out, it's, uh, it, it's just something that the Lord has impressed upon us that we want to try to do if, if God's in it. And we're just kind of testing the waters, as it were. Uh, but one of the issues for the people up there, uh, and these are good people, that last, uh, last Sunday morning, we were streaming in a village, and there was about 314 people 
that showed up out there just to, just to watch the Mzungu preacher and hear the Word of God, and we, we just we think the world of them. Something to consider is that when Jesus had a gathering of people, he felt obligated to provide for their needs, food and water. And if you remember, he did that. He five loaves and two fishes, and he fed, fed, uh, fed 5,000 men plus their wives and children. So there may have been in excess of anywhere from fifteen to 20,000 people gathered out here. And Jesus felt obligated. He, his heart moved, and he, and he wanted to feed them. And so what we're wanting to do, they fight in that area over water. Sounds like California. They fight up there over water because it's scarce. And if somebody has a well, then they all of a sudden don't let anybody else have access to the well. And what we want to do is dig public access wells of water so that the people can go in peace without in being in danger of being shot or killed and get water absolutely free. All right? So if you can help us out, go to, uh, what is the website? Um, Bethel International Church Ministries. Just type that in at Google, and, and you will find it. All right? Uh, Alicia, send me the website. Okay? Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Oh, this is... I, here, I got an email that says... Golden State, Jack, Trevor, it's the best, Santa Clara, California. I have no idea what that means, okay? Lori writes again and says, thank you, Pastor Mike. I got it now. Also, I watched Bruce Jenner's, the athlete formerly known as Bruce, interview about his changing. In that interview, he did say that we are going to change the world. The first thing I thought of was Mystery Babylon the harlot. I, I'm listen. I, there is a transformation coming with all of this sodomite stuff and all this transgender. They're transgendering, and they are trans species changing, and they are trans enabled, and they are trans this and trans that. They're changing everything. All right. Now, George writes in. He's going to fill me in on what a soul tie is. He said, Pastor Mike found this on Google. A soul tie is like a linkage in the soul realm between two people. It links their souls together, which can bring forth both beneficial results and negative results. Um, and then there's a website here. I'm George, I'm, you got me curious now. A soul tie is a linkage in the soul realm between two people. And then here is a, um, a website, Ministering Deliverance. Okay, the positive effect of a soul tie. In godly marriage, God links the two together, and the Bible tells us they become one flesh. As a result of them becoming one flesh, it binds them together. They will cleave to one another in a unique way. Can I be honest with you? I mean, you want me to be honest, right? I think this is a bunch of hooey, is what I think. I, I, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this, this a church website. And the church website, ministeringdeliverance.com, says a, in a godly marriage, God links the two together, and the Bible tells us they become one flesh. As a result of them becoming one flesh, it binds them together in their souls. Now, here's my problem with that. You, they used a verse here that doesn't mean anything about what they want you to think it means. God said, God said, Therefore shall a man cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one what? Flesh. Didn't say anything about their soul. And maybe I'm ignorant. Maybe I'm ignorant. Some of you are going, well, you nailed that one. Maybe I'm ignorant, but I don't think I see anything in the Bible about our souls being tied together. So I'm going to be honest with everybody. I'm not buying it. This doesn't sound like something that I've read in the Bible and I've been just missing it. I, I don't see how the physical joining together of a man and woman, the two becoming one flesh, I don't see how that ties their souls together. 
the original email that came in was, um, was there any help or deliverance if you've had, had a soul tie with someone and that soul tie is broken? I'm just being dead honest with you. I know absolutely nothing biblical about anything of a so-called soul tie. Um, okay, there's another verse here. It's 1 Samuel 18, 1. It came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Okay, okay, I kind of I kind of get that. I kind of understand it. Um and so on. But I I don't know. I I'm I'm just gonna say I'm ignorant on this one. All right. I'm going to say I'm ignorant on this, and, and I'm not going to say anything until I look into more of what the Bible says and then more of what something like this says. And I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm going, to, I'm going to back away here, all right? I'm just going to back away here and, and not say a whole, I don't want to say anything against God, but I don't want to say, well, you know, obviously this is of God. I don't want to do that, all right? So I'm going to back away. I'm going to claim ignorance here. I'm going to move on. But I, I will tell you this. Be careful of so-called deliverance ministries. Be careful. Okay? A lot of them are all about performing a ritual to do something in the in the spirit realm or whatever. It's all about ritualism. If you say these words and perform this, now turn three times, go through the fire tunnel and stuff like that. And I'm not big on that. You know what I'm big on? I'm big on crying out unto the Lord and he delivered me. That's my that's deliverance ministry right there. Go read Psalms. Go read the book of Psalms. Go read all 150 Psalms. I promise you, you'll see simple things in there like I cried unto the Lord and he, and he heard me. I cry, sh- sh- cried out unto the Lord and, and he delivered me. That's the kind of deliverance ministry that I think I'm in favor of. But I'm just, I'm just telling you be careful of it, all right? Soul time. I'm going to have to remember that one. Uh, let's see here. What else? Um, Barbara says, thanks. Oh, on the Bible college thing. Thanks, Pastor Mike. I was asking on behalf of my son, and your answer is what I was expecting. What would you recommend for a young man who wants to serve the Lord in these perilous days? Barbara, let me tell you what I did. God's still calling people. Don't get me wrong. God is still calling people. And if God is calling your, your young son, here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's what a wise man told me when I was answered the call of the ministry when I was 16. This wise man, Preacher Golf, who was my pastor here, said, Mike, he said, let me tell you something. He said, are you sure that God called you to preach? And I said, yeah. And he said, here's what I'm going to tell you then. He said, God called Samuel. He ended up calling him four times. And God would call Samuel in the middle of the night, and Samuel would rise up and he'd go to Eli. And Eli, what do you want? Eli said, I can call you. Go lay back down. Samuel lay back down. Sure enough, he said, Samuel. He rose up, went back to Eli. Eli, you called me. He said, no, no, I didn't. Happens again the third time. Eli perceives what's going on. And he said, Samuel, next time this happens, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And the fourth time God called, uh, Samuel answered that same thing. And God called him to the ministry that he was in right then and there. And here's what I'm going to tell you, uh, Barbara, and this is what I'm going to recommend for you and your son. If your son feels like he's being called to God's service, all right, it is the Bible says make make your calling and election sure. Because right after, right after I um, surrendered to the call to the ministry here at this church, there was two younger teenage boys going to church here with me. That not too long after I surrendered. They came down and they said that they felt like God was calling them to the ministry. Okay, neither one of them are in it to this day. Neither one of them. One of them tried it for a while and it just never worked out. And um, what I'm telling, what I'm saying to you is, is that I it, it it I can't tell you 
if God is called your son or not. But your son has an obligation to make sure before he just dives into something to make sure that God is calling him. Number two, if he is sure or he is in the assurance process, he's seeking the Lord to know. I would just recommend waiting on the Lord and doing doing what I did at the start of the Watchman video broadcast, Pastor Mike Online, and all the things that I'm doing now. I didn't sit and write out a long-range plan of what I wanted to do here at this church, but I'm going to be honest with you. I tried it, and I spent in, um, in November of 2008, I spent three days in my office fasting. And the reason why I did that, I wasn't just saying, hey, I think I'm going to fast for three days, see what that'll do to me. Okay, I, I know I was under such a heavy burden. I was absolutely miserable. My wife knew it. The people that were around me here knew it. I was miserable. And my wife said, what is wrong with you? What's going on? I said, honey, I don't know. I just feel, I don't know, I just feel like I'm, I'm not doing what God wants. And I want you to help me pray about that. And she did. But I just, under that weight and under that burden, I spent three days from morning to evening. I didn't eat. Evening, I would break the fast, but the next day I did it again. But what I told God is I didn't, I didn't have an idea of how long I was going to do it. I just told God, God, I'm not going to, I'm going to wrestle with you. Me and you's going to wrestle every day when I get here to church. Me and you's going to wrestle every day until you bless me. God, if you want me out of the ministry, I'll get out of the ministry. If you want me to go somewhere else, I'll go somewhere else. If you want me to go out and hang drywall and paint houses, I'll go out and hang drywall and paint houses. I don't care. I don't care. And I, I've spent three days just trying to come up with ideas of things to do, and i write something down. No sooner than I'd write it down, I'd go, that's stupid. That won't work. That's nothing. And all that, all those things I tried to write down. Do you know what I never wrote down? Watch my video broadcast. Uh, uh, once weekly Bible prophecy teaching and current events news thing. Never, never came into my mind. Not one time. So I knew it wasn't my idea. I knew it wasn't me that was that was walking in this direction. It was it was the Lord. God said, "Do this." So I did it one time, and it immediately took off. And I knew that that was of the Lord because I mean it was like the easiest thing in the world to do, and it was and it just came from the Lord. And what I'm telling you, Barbara, is and and I would tell your son this: if God calls you, He's not just going to leave you out there hanging, saying, "Well, well, come on, what are you what are you waiting on? Why don't you do something?" God's not like that. God is a very specific God. And when he is ready to move in your son, all of a sudden your son will be right where God wants him to be. That's just how it works, all right? And people ask me, how do you discern God's will? I say, I don't know. You just kind of pray God, God put me in your will, and all of a sudden there you are right there in God's will. And you have no idea how you got there. You just say, well, it must have been God because here I am, okay? That's what I'm telling you, Barbara. That's, that's as simple as what it really is, all right? If God wants your son to pastor somewhere, that's what he's going to be doing. If God wants your son to be a missionary somewhere, if God wants your son to do this or do that, all of a sudden he's going to wake up one day and that's what he's doing, okay? And, and I'm just telling you, that's just how it works that way, all right? So hope that hope that's a blessing to you. Uh, Ellen writes in and says, Derek is quoting the New American Standard of the Bible. Now, the New American Standard Bible, from what I heard, is the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew. Not. Uh, Ellen, thank you for that. Um, ooh, here we go. Sebastiano and Tiffany write in. How you guys doing? By the way, this is not a couple of guys. It's actually a girl and a guy, and they're married. Okay, anyway, Pastor Mike, soul tying. Uh, send me some information on that. They're saying that soul tying is witchcraft, okay? I sus suspect it, but I want to be able to see the evidence. All right, appreciate that. Uh, John, John writes in and says, Pastor Mike, today the Lord gave me an idea that the Old Testament was made flesh, fleshly covenant, flesh died and became a spirit covenant. Just thought I'd share that with you because I'm excited about it. And actually... Uh, John, you're 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 dead on. If you look at look at the heaven and earth situation, there's a heaven and earth that exists right now. Then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. What's going to happen to the old heaven and the old earth? It's going to pass away. It's going to be gone, melt with a fervent heat. 
Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That there cannot be, there cannot exist in this universe two me's. The old one's going to pass away. Where, where do you put new wine? It's got to go into a new bottle. It can't go into an old bottle. Okay? And so we have two births, two creations, two comings of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have two testaments. The first testament is of the earth. It deals with Adam. The first Adam was of the earth, earthy. That's why he was called Adam. Adam or Edom. Basically, it means red earth. It means like the color of clay, the color of dirt, because that's what we're made of. And so the, the first Adam deals with the first covenant, which deals with the first creation. Everything in this, in this physical world that we live in and all flesh, that's what the Old Testament deals with. The New Testament deals with spiritual things from an everlasting place called heaven, not of this earth. The Old Testament had an earthly mediator. That was Moses. The New Testament has a mediator that comes to us from God himself, from heaven. The Old Covenant was written in stone. The New Covenant is all about the Spirit. And so, John... You're exactly right on that. I think you, and no wonder you're excited about it because it just makes sense. That that'll keep that excitement will keep you from when people come to you and say, "What you don't keep the feast days? We're supposed to keep the Passover. You don't keep the Passover. What about the Feast of Pentecost? You mean you don't do that? You mean you don't keep the law? You don't keep Torah? Don't you know that Jesus came to instruct us to keep the Torah? Don't you know that? And say, no, I'm sorry, that first covenant's dead. That first covenant's over with, as far as I'm concerned. And when this flesh dies, the Old, the Old Testament rule over it dies with it. I come under the terms of a new covenant, not a renewed Old Covenant. That's what you tell people, all right? Um, Jay, how you doing, Jay? He says, this is my first Saturday in the prison ministry. Uh, do you have a word of advice for me? Uh, well, Jay, we hope that it's not because you're going to prison this Saturday, okay? By the way, Ken Hovind! Ken Hovind! Yay! He's finally out of prison! <laughs> it's like in the first the, the first thing that most guys go after when they get out of prison is fried chicken and pizza. And that's the pictures I've seen. He's eating chicken and he's eating pizza, Okay. And going to Dairy Queen, and, you know, the guy gets out of prison. That's what he wants. He wants real food, not prison food anymore. So anyway, uh, we're glad for Kent and uh, pray for him and pray for his ministry. He's got a lot of things to catch up on and a lot of things to do. And uh, I don't know Kent. I, um, I don't uh, I have had no association with him. I'm not friends with him or anything like that. Uh, but I've seen some of his work, and I appreciate his stand on the King James. And so may the Lord may the Lord bless him. All right, uh, Jay. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. What little bit I know about it, guys in prison. Um. If you're in prison, it's because you are known to be a pretty bad person. I would think that guys in prison would be able to detect if you went in there with anything fake, phony, or false, they'll pick up on it. They can read people. They're used to it. That's how they survive. And so I would say, Jay, go in there most of these guys are going to be pretty rough. I would plan on being rough. My good friend, Pastor Reg Kelly, um, for years, he then people in his church and people from all over the place have helped him with this. They've had a truck stop ministry. And what that means is that for years, they, they were using cassettes. Now they're using CDs. And for years people in different places around the country 
would get um, a copy of some of Red's, Reg's messages. I uh, got a friend down at his church, Joel Friend. That's his name. He's My friend is named Friend. And um, he's, he's the one that taught me how to do video editing and things like that. And he's been doing Reg's sermons for years. But anyway, R- Reg will tell you that if you've listened to Reg preach, he's pretty rough and he's pretty mean about some things. He don't back down. He's a man's man is what he is. And that rings with a lot of truck drivers. There are not too many sissy truck drivers, okay? Um, There are no truck driver sodomite wedding chapels, okay? But anyway, a lot of them are just men's men, and they like Reg because he's a Brillo pad preacher. It's rough sometimes. It's mean. It's hard. And these guys can relate to that. And, Jay, what I'm going to tell you is is to spend time in prayer before you go because you are going into a very dark spiritual place, all right? Uh, number two, I'm going to tell you that these guys will see through anything that's fake. Number three, they're not going to be handled. If you go in there and try to handle them, they're not, they're not, going, to, they're not going to have that. And so just go in there, go with God, and, um, and just be prayed up because there's a lot of very, the, the very worst people in America are in one of two places, federal prisons or Washington, D.C. That's pretty good. So anyway, hopefoundationbicm.org is the web address uh, if you want to help us out with Kenya, all right? Anita says, perilous is not difficult. Well, it is. I mean, it's not, but it, it's never mind. You know what I mean. The word perilous does not equal the word difficult. Okay, thanks, Pastor, for talking about the difference between difficulty and perilous. It is the English Standard Version. I looked up the definition differences. Wow, I see why the KJV is a good standard to use. I think I get it, too. Amen, Anita. I appreciate that. She sends me some of the definitions of perilous and perilous is full of danger it's you could die okay perilous is walking a a, a tightrope between two buildings in sao paulo brazil that actually happened one of the what is it one of the walensa guys the the flying walensas these the circus family that walked these tight ropes and the Papa Walensa decided he was going to walk a tight rope between two buildings down in Brazil with no safety harness, no safety wire on. And he did fine until he got out there in the middle and the wind started blowing and blew him right off and killed him. Okay. That's perilous. Walking a tight rope between two poles, three inches off the ground is difficult but it's not perilous, okay? Appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Joshua says, Hi, Pastor Mike Hopal as well. Can you do, or maybe you already have one, a video on these great signs and wonders with examples from the Word, also examples going on today. I'm investigating, researching through the Word how these snakes work so I can warn people and, of course, by the Lord's help, stay away from deception. Thanks and God bless. He's quoting Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Um, Joshua, I'm going to to be honest with you. I don't know. um, I don't know all of these great wonders. I know that one of them is going to be fire from heaven. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But I don't know exactly, and I'm not sure the Bible really tells unless somebody can illuminate me here. I didn't know that. Saul and Jonathan had their soul knitted together. But anyway, um, I don't know exactly what they are. But when, when we see them, and then we hear what the false prophets are going to say, we are going to go, he's a liar, and that's a lying sign and wonder. Okay? I, 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 don't think, I don't think we know right now. I don't think we will know. Maybe we will. Maybe there's other things in the Bible that explain that. 
But what I'm saying to you is, is that God's people, the, ver the truly elect, that's what the word very means. It does not mean levels of election, as some people teach. Some people teach that there are levels of election, and the bad elect people, they have to go through bad stuff before they can go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. But the very elect means truly elect, and the truly elect are not going to be deceived by those things. We're going to see them and go, okay, wow, that's pretty cool. But then we're going to hear what's being said, and we're going to go, no, no, sir. No, you're a liar. You're a liar because God said this. We're going to quote scripture to him. Okay? That's what I, um, something that popped into my mind was, where was this? Back in Finland or somewhere, several years ago, Obama was over there. And you remember seeing that spiral up in the, up in the sky, in the atmosphere? You remember seeing that? I watched, I saw pictures of it. And I'm just going, that's weird. I saw video of it here just not too long ago. First time I watched video of it, and I'm just going, that's weird. That is, oh, that's weird. I have no idea what that is, okay? I may not be able to explain that, but if somebody comes along and says, oh, that's, uh, that's Maitreya speaking to us, I'm going, okay, I'm out of here. Okay, that was a lying sign and wonder. I think, I think the, the signs and wonders are going to be great because that's what it says, and I think it's going to blow people's minds, and they're going to believe that this stuff is that these people have real power. There's some people who believe David Blaine, who is who calls himself the street magician. He's done a lot of stunts here lately, here and there, but people would see him supposedly float up in the air two or three inches and do some of the things, and people would be going, I think he's got real magic. I think he's like, he does real magic. That's not a trick. They're tricks. Okay? And just about any magician can spot them, and there's always going to be somebody that's going to put up a website and say, this is how he did it. This is like real cool. It looks like I'm doing it, but this is how he did it. But I think that the false prophets of the last days are going to be able to do things that's going to blow people's minds, and they're not going to be able to figure it out. And then these guys, and they're going to be convinced that these people have real powers, and these guys are going to start saying, follow me, do what I tell you to do, listen to me. And God's people are going to go, no, you're a false Christ. No, I'm not following you. You, you, didn't, use, you didn't use King James verses, okay? So I'm not, I'm not following you. Um, Sebastiano and Tiffany, again, right in about soul ties. Pastor, it's used in Japan, Japanese Shintoism. They believe the souls of families are tied together after death. And they go to the soul society to live forever together. A soul, boy, I'm learning something new every day. A soul society. This sounds like a, a 70s rhythm and blues group. Okay? The soul society. Coming up. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Shane, who is a Cleveland Browns fan. How do I know that? Because that's what's in his email. Dear Pastor Mike, in Matthew 5.44 it says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The question is, how do you pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you? When you're hurting so deeply from something someone has done to you, what do you pray Thank you for taking time to answer this, as our family has been hurt deeply by a person, and we truly want to abide um, by God's word, but we're not sure how to pray for this person when the hurt seems deeper than trying to find kind words to pray. Now, Shane, uh, believe it or not, I've, I've been through some stuff, okay? I have, uh, I've been hurt by people. I've been hurt by people that I did everything in the world to try to help them. And I know all about being bitter. I know about being bitter and carrying bitterness around and having bitter dreams about people that did me wrong. 
I know all about that. When someone first gives an offense to you, a deep cut offense, I don't know that it's possible to not be bitter and in much pain and angry at them. I don't know that it's possible to not be. I certainly wasn't. And over time, I found myself making myself pray, God, every emotion in my body hates their guts. But God, they're yours, and you do with them what pleases you. And forgive me of hating their guts. And God, take this pain away from me. Now, emotional pain is like physical pain. If it, if you're wounded, so if you, I don't know, you get stabbed or something like that, if you're physically wounded, it hurts bad for a while. And over time, the pain subsides. It goes away. The body heals. There may be a scar there. Every now and then when the weather moves in, now you're not doing so well, okay? And here's what I'm saying. Emotional pain tends to be the same way, like when somebody dies or when someone hurts you or offends you, someone that you thought was your friend, when you get betrayed by people, and I've been betrayed before, when you get betrayed by them, Initially, you are hurt, you are angry, you are very vengeful, you hate them, and you want to see them harmed. You want revenge enacted on them. And I'm going to confess that I've tried it. I've tried to get revenge on some people that hurt me bad. And I finally got on my face before God and said, God, I know I'm doing wrong. And God, I'm asking for your help to stop because I don't want to stop. I want to keep hurting them back. God, I need your help. In the flesh, you can't do it. And your flesh will always want to be mad at them. And you know what people do sometimes? Instead of letting the wound heal, they'll pick at it. They'll reopen, they'll pick the scab off like little kids and reopen the wound just to, I don't know, for whatever reason. See, I'm still hurt. See? That's, I mean, that's how we are. And what I'm telling you is that over time, some of that pain goes away, and at some point, enough of that pain goes away to where you're willing to say, Father, forgive them, and Father, you bless them. And Father, you do what pleases and honors you. Okay? I had a situation this year where I was able to go up to someone that I was very, years ago, was very angry at, very bitter at, and I walked right up to them, and I hugged them, and I said, I love you. And that person just broke down in tears, saying, you don't know how bad I wanted to hear that, okay? Now, we don't go fishing together. Of course, I don't go fishing. We, we, don't, we don't hang out. We're not friends on Facebook. We are separated from each other, and that's probably where we need to stay, and that's fine because forgiveness does not mean fellowship. Jacob and Esau, did they forgave, but they did not fellowship after that. Abraham and Lot parted company. They did not fellowship after that. Mark and Paul, there was tension between them. God used both of them, but they separated. Forgiveness does not mean fellowship. Keep that in mind. But at some point, after a while, the pain goes down enough to where you can say, okay, God, I'm not as mad as I used to be. I'm not as hurt as I used to be. I'm not as bitter as I used to be. And God, that's good. You keep it going. And God, help me, help me to fall in line with your word by being able to forgive them of what they did. Okay? 
God and God knows you, Shane. God knows you better than you know yourself. And so trust him and just kind of kind of use that for an example, all right? I uh, appreciate you sending that in. Let's see here. Uh, Mary says, hey, Pastor Mike, just tune in. So I don't know if you talked about this today. I was watching the service yesterday. Someone's phone went off with a weather warning. Um, even though I live in Michigan, I have Festus on my phone. I was shocked that the warning was a tornado warning. Glad your church wasn't blown away. There was a a tornado that touched down just north of here, a tornado that touched down just south of here, but not one that here. And so we are praising the Lord for that. Appreciate that, Mary. Um, Peter said, Dear Mike, after the fall, God says to Eve, Your desire shall be for him, and he shall rule over you. This has an impact on the soul. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 18, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Therefore, fornication is very dangerous. A man becomes a whoremonger and a woman becomes a whore. This really messes up God's perfect plan for marriage. God bless. Peter. Uh, Peter, I would, I would agree with what the scriptures are saying here. I absolutely would. Um, God's perfect plan for marriage and Peter, I, I, you know, I don't know where you're coming from with this, but what I'm going to tell you is I don't know of a marriage that I'm associated with in my family or in my church, among my friends, and even mine that has not been hurt by some aspect of this world creeping into it. I don't know of a one. God's perfect plan for marriage will be when Jesus and his bride are together forever. That, as far as I'm concerned, will be the only perfect marriage ever. My wife and I, we love each other. We love each other more now than we ever have, ever. And tomorrow's our anniversary, 28 years together. I don't want to be with anybody else. She doesn't want to be with anybody else. She doesn't want me to be with anybody else. I don't want her to be with anybody else. We respect each other. We are friends. We rely on each other. She knows my weaknesses. I know hers. And we support each other in that. I don't think to this day we have a perfect marriage. I don't think we do. And um, I did a Bible study yesterday. Um, and I asked people to pray for me, an hour and 40 minutes. First, it's the longest pure Bible study I've ever done. And it's not Revelation 13. It's called For Those Who Struggle. And when I got ready to, to edit it, rendered it, the computer crashed twice. So I had problems with it. And there's a couple of errors in the video. If you watch it, you'll see it. Uh, but it's out there now, and it is intended to be for those who are not perfect. It's intended to be for those who do not have perfect marriages. It's intended to be for those who have made numerous mistakes in life, and they're carrying the baggage around of those mistakes. And I agree with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians that he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. And I agree that it messes up God's plan, perfect plan for marriage. But I also say that there is no such thing here on this earth as God's perfect marriage, not until Christ and his bride are joined together. So, again, I don't know where you were coming from with this, Peter, but that's just kind of my thoughts on it, all right? Glenn, how you doing, Glenn? Uh, says, Pastor Mike, your comments about water for Kenya caught my interest. I went to school with George Green of Water Missions uh, Internal, maybe that's international, here in Charleston, South Carolina. They are a Christian group who go all over the world establishing water purity in poor and destroyed areas. I don't know about drilling for wells, but certain about purifying the water, would this link be of interest to you? Glenn, I, it is. I'm going to send this on. Um, let me do that. And I will forward that. And I appreciate you putting me in touch with that. I really do appreciate it. 
Um, Don says, Dear Pastor Mike, soul tying is indeed witchcraft, as evidence in the below passage. Ezekiel 13, 18, and they say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? Uh, you know, I'm going to look into that. I appreciate you sending me that email as well. Romans 2, Barry says, Hi, Pastor Mike, Romans 2, what is old man? Let's see here, Romans 2. Two, I'll have to open up to Romans 2. I'm having fun today, everybody. I appreciate you listening in and helping the show go along. I'm not, I'm not myself today. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not, I'm not me today, all right? And um, we are getting ready to go to Kenya, and I'm mindful of that. I'm excited about going, and I've got some things that I think it's going to be exciting to share with him out there, some things that's exciting that I'm going to share at homecoming, uh, but I am not doing well today, all right? So you keep me in your prayers, all right? Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore thou art excuse, inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for in thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judges doest the same Things And you're asking, what is old man? I think it is talking to fools of Romans chapter 1, verse 22, and not to believers. What do you think? Um, Barry, it's talking to man. It's addressing us and lost people so that we realize and, and, and understand, understand where Paul's coming from here in Romans. Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way, he, even in chapter 11, he's talking about Israel. Paul came from this background that said, we're the Jews, we're the seed of Abraham, uh, we're the true people of God, and God hates everybody else except us. That's, where, that's what Paul was trained in. That's why he was going after the Christians. And so Paul's got his head on straight now, and he's heard all of his life these Jewish rabbis telling these people, oh, thou shalt not, if you commit adultery, you're evil. And Paul said, really? Well, what about when you steal stuff? You're inexcusable. Um, Barry, I want you to look, I, and I see what you're saying here, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Barry, go back to Romans chapter 1. Verses 29, 30, 31, and so on. Look at those verses. And if you see anything in these verses that you've been guilty of, then you are, oh man. I'm going to read the list. Yep. Didn't have to get too far with that. I'm guilty. I read the whole list. Yep, I'm guilty. And what he's saying here, you read the, you read the context of Romans 1, and then keep reading in chapter 2. He says, um, oh, let's see here. Verse 3, Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? The old man in Romans chapter 2 is everybody who's ever done anything in this list of 29, 30, and 31, and that's me and that's you. You are inexcusable. You have violated the law of God. You needed a Savior like everybody else in the world does. And so you can't point your finger at everybody else and saying, this is, oh, they're doing bad things. I don't do those, the things. That, I'm not a sodomite like they are, or I'm not this or I'm not that. I'm not accusing you, Barry. I'm just saying, that old man is to every man. The, the expression, O oh, man, is he is speaking to humanity. All of those who are of the species of man are part of that inexcusable crowd. All right? Um, I am, I've got some, some more emails to, to look at here. Uh, but I think I'm going to call it quits for today, okay? 
Um, like I say, I'm just, I'm not myself today. Um, I'm just, a, I have no reason to be down in the dumps, but I am. And so I, I have enjoyed this uh, walk through the scriptures and answering questions and having a good time uh, between us. Uh, but I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take a little leave today early. All right, and I appreciate you uh, forbearing with me. And yes. I think that's the music. I think I hear the music. Anyway, um, got a new Watchmen series coming out this Sunday. Lindsay is editing it as we are speaking, and uh, hope you enjoy it. And um, just just pray for our ministry, okay? Uh, devil doesn't like devil doesn't like what we do here, okay? He's going to place burdens on us. He's going to lay things on us. So you pray for us. I pray for you. You're the reason why I'm here, okay? You're the reason why I'm here. So it's good to be with you today. I appreciate you. I love you, and we'll see you later.